Mrs. G is inside her office with Tony. So when you're ready to leave, just knock on her door so she knows. Testing one, two, three, four, five. Everyone, everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're about to begin, so we'll talk to you soon.
Hi everyone, welcome, and we're about to begin, so I figure I just give a couple more moments for persons who are just getting home, hopefully, to be able to jump online and, and be with us. Um, so bear with us a little bit. We are about to begin, and um, I'll try to see if we can get everything wrapped up as close to 7 o'clock as possible. So bear with me.
Okay, welcome everyone to another episode of our Patient Health Workshop. It is indeed my pleasure to be able to share this information with you. And I do hope that as we go through tonight's <laughs> um, class that you will learn a thing or two and I'm hopeful also that I do not say too many things that are very controversial because in the current climate of censorship that is rampant on social media now, I would hate for any video that I am presenting to be taken down um, because of sharing factual information that is not popular information, right? Because it's not that they, these persons who are the police of the free speech or what is said on, on, on the World Wide Web, that these persons care whether or not the information that is shared is factual. It's just whether the information agrees with their position. And so I think we're, in, we're living in a very dangerous time now. Um, pretty soon, the very reason I started having, you know, our patient health workshops, whereby we could dispel some misconceptions about um, healthcare, misconceptions about um, healing, about how the body works, um, with the general public, we've now gotten to a place where we might not be able to continue to do that because, you know, unless you are agreeing with the with the narrative of the of the mainstream, um, you're gonna be, you know, a target. So, I don't really want to have a target on my back, but at the same time, I want to make sure that the information that I share with my listeners, my viewers, my friends, my patients, my colleagues, that that information, if it's beneficial, that they can receive that information. All right. So it is what it is. And, you know, what are we going to do? Right. What are we going to do? So here we are. We're looking at the topic of getting the seven keys to getting and staying well. The seven keys to getting and staying well. So let us begin without any further ado. And welcome to everyone who has joined us. Let me give a quick shout out here to um, our friends who have joined us on social media. Um, so let's see, we have Maureen, we have Charmaine, welcome, welcome, welcome. Monica, welcome. In fact, I, I'm noticing here, Monica, that you're, you're, that you're you know, I think it's your um maiden and last name Douglas Gardner is interesting because I have an uncle by the name of, du of, of Douglas so I have a Douglas Gardner as my uncle and you're Monica Douglas Gardner so it's kind of <laughs> kind of fun for me to see that um so it's welcome nonetheless um welcome Neris if this is Neris or someone using Neris's account welcome again Sharon it's always a pleasure having you join us um, Karelia, it is obviously, um, a distinct pleasure there. And, um, I always enjoy when my patients are able to jump online. I have a particular thrill when it's, um, guests or friends or family members or patients of mine. So we get to say, welcome, welcome. Who is Derryberry? Um, whoever it is that's under the, the, the title Derryberry, if you could just indicate your your actual name so i can know who you are um because i think i've seen you before i just can't i just can't quite get it 
get my mind wrapped around it now. But anyhow, welcome. So the topic as we are looking at it for today is the seven keys to getting and staying well. And so the first key that we need to that we'll come across is understanding the difference between sick care and health care. And when we talk about healthcare, we're talking about the main system that is responsible for the health of the population. So we call it the healthcare system, mainstream healthcare system. Now, the mainstream healthcare system has limitations and the average person might not recognize that there are limitations in the mainstream system as it is established because the system is not focused on optimizing health. The system is not focused on promoting a wellness lifestyle. The system is actually focused on two things, two very important things, but two things that don't necessarily um, are in, that are not necessarily in sync with with wellness or a wellness lifestyle, and that is to save lives and to ease suffering. Those are the two main objectives of the mainstream healthcare system um, to save lives and to ease suffering. Now, those are two very important purposes. And so, you know, we do not want to belittle what the healthcare system does. It offers a very important service. But the healthcare system has these limitations because of its philosophy. But they are the ones who are best suited to play the role that they play. It just so happens that when it comes to true health or being optimally well, more is oftentimes needed than just simply waiting until there is a disease and us trying to fix it. What we try to understand is that when persons want to have optimal health, we can't simply wait for something to go wrong first. We have to do the best we can to intervene or to make choices before things start to go wrong to prevent them from going wrong in the first place. So we liken the healthcare system to sick care or illness care because in the current healthcare model, mainstream, the focus is caring for the sick. So we call that sick care. So whenever I say sick care, I'm simply making a distinction between um, the wellness model of, of, of health and the model that is focused on caring for the sick, right? And there's nothing wrong with caring for the sick. And if I get sick, I will want to get care as well. So please don't, don't misunderstand. But the problem or the limitation of the sick care system is that it is reactive. So this system is reactive. And what do we mean by reactive? And ladies and gentlemen, if you're joining us, I invite you to make your comments as we're going through because your participation will help. Well, it certainly will help keep me awake, but certainly it will help to keep you engaged. And so you have a better chance of um, enjoying yourselves tonight. So please indicate for us. Um, what do we mean by reactive? That the system is reactive. So I'll give a couple seconds before I give my answer so that if you want to chime in, you may do so. And by reactive, we simply mean that something has to go wrong first. And then in response to that which has gone wrong, then the action is, is, is made. The problem with that is that sometimes the very thing that goes wrong is something that cannot be fixed. Or what if the thing that goes wrong is something that leads to your death? So those are limitations of the reactionary approach. We can't simply wait for something to go wrong because we might not be able to recover from the thing that goes wrong. So if we can make choices to lower the likelihood of something going wrong in our systems, then we are increasing the likelihood of achieving or obtaining optimal health. And so sick care, we say, is reactive. And true health care, then, in converse, would be considered proactive, which means 
we have to make choices before the event happens to prevent the event from happening. So, for example, cancer is something that nobody wants to happen, I'm sure, in their lives or in the lives of their loved ones. But many people don't know that there are things that you can do to lower the likelihood of developing cancer in yourselves or in your family members. Now, when we think of health, health is, I think health is a very simple thing to, to, to conceptualize, but not necessarily a very easy thing to actualize, right? So we can conceive of health in a very easy way, but it's hard to make it reality. The easy concept when it comes to true health or optimal health is this. Your body needs two things. It needs enough of the things that it requires and it needs to avoid anything that can hurt it. So anything that is needed, it needs to have it. And anything that can harm it, it needs to avoid it. Those two things are the hallmark of optimal health, right? You know, have the things that you need to have, avoid the things that you don't need to have. Now, as we move forward, and I see there are a couple of answers. Um, Malik or Lorna has indicated acting in response to a situation is reactive. That is correct. That is correct. Now, we are in a, a crisis as it relates to healthcare. The crisis is that um, the number one reason, I don't know if everybody knows this, whenever you hear of people going bankrupt or people um, spending off their life savings or people going into debt, the number one reason for personal, not business, but personal bankruptcy is healthcare costs. That's the number one reason that people get sick. That, not get sick. That's the number one reason for persons to um, lose their wealth is because of some healthcare crisis. I mean, let's face it. How many people or how many people's life savings are robust enough to handle a cancer diagnosis with mainstream treatments of chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and whatever else? possibly surgery that, that may, may follow. Um, and so this is a very serious thing, right? So we are in a crisis. So the, the, the way we currently have been treating with or treating healthcare issues, we need to change that. We can't simply um, go about the place hoping that, that we're going to be well without doing anything that's required for us to be well. We have to start making changes in our life. And one of those changes, I know a lot of Jamaicans think that Jamaican food is healthy. The bottom line is, if you think that the way Jamaicans eat is healthy, then what I'm going to encourage you to do is look around at the Jamaicans that you see. How healthy are we? I remember once upon a time, you know, when I used to travel to the U.S. Um, I'm not sure if I'll ever travel there again, but when I traveled to the U.S., when I was at school studying or, you know, when I was in university or at um, my postdoctorate, my doctorate training or my postdoctorate training. If you eat like they do in the U.S., you gain a lot of weight. And then when you return to Jamaica and you eat almost the same amount of food, you start to lose weight. This was probably true, say, 20 years ago. Well, it's not so true anymore. In fact, our diet has gotten so bad that the waistline of our Jamaican, the average Jamaican, is increasing. Most Jamaicans, unless, of course, you just can't afford to eat very much, most Jamaicans are overfed and are gaining weight every year. Maybe 5 pounds every year, maybe 15 pounds every year. I was also gaining a lot of weight. I had to make some drastic changes to how I ate to ensure that I stayed healthy. So let's start to move forward because I don't want this to get boring in any way. 
And, um, you know, if you're digging what we're saying, please go ahead and do a shout out, you know, say amen, whatever, so that we know that you are enjoying what we're talking about. If not, then, you know, you know, well, you know where the, the dial is. <laughs> so let's move forward, shall we? So if we want to be healthy, we have to change the way we think. We can't simply just hope to change our behavior without first changing our mindset. Because that is how it that that how that is how it's done, right? You change the way you think first, and then that change of thought process will automatically change the way you behave. So there are two ways of thinking. One is illness care, and the other one is wellness care. The the, the illness care thought says that you know we have to wait till something goes wrong first, and then we try to intervene. And the wellness care thought says. I will do everything in my power now to eat and to live in such a way to prevent things from going wrong in the first place. So, what are the two ways that we think? According to the illness model, we simply ask this question. What do I need to do in order to feel better? It's like just as if feeling better is the end all and be all of, of our existence. You know, you have a little headache. You, you first ask, you know, doc, is there anything I can take to feel a little better? Or you have a backache. Doc, you have anything you can give me to feel better? Or you don't write prescriptions because, you know, I, I was looking for some medication to help me feel better. Which is true because that's what medications do. Medications don't necessarily solve a problem unless we're talking about an infectious disease. In the case of um, antibiotics... In the case of very few antivirals, in the case of antifungals, and in the case of antiparasitic, parasitic, antiparasitic um, agents, those will kill a parasite, kill an, a bacterium, potentially kill a virus, um, kill fungus or fungi, so that we can recover. But apart from that, most other medications don't address anything any underlying cause and they address a symptom or a sign a sign is something that a change in your body in response to um, a disease that can be measured scientifically or can be observed a symptom is a change that happens that the patient perceives within themselves so people will feel cold and chilly when they're having a fever. Now the symptom is feeling cold and chilly. The sign is the fever because that is something that you measure with a, with a thermometer to determine if somebody has a fever. You don't simply feel a fever. You will feel the telltale signs of the effects of having one, but you don't really feel the fever itself. I don't know if I'm making myself clear. Well, simply wanting to feel better is not enough to move you on the path to wellness if you want to move on the path to wellness you have to ask a different question when you have an issue rather than asking what do i need to do to feel better ask this question what do i need to do in order to get better because getting better is a much higher priority than simply feeling better and did you know that you can feel better without getting better at all or without moving one step closer to better health Next one is getting well. Um, we use wellness as if it's some kind of a destination. You know, I want to be well. Um, what do I need to achieve this or how can I get there? Wellness is not a destination. Wellness is a lifestyle. It is a journey. And so when you think about it, you know, persons who are in it for the destination, if you're driving to Ocherios, for example, from Kingston, and you're only interested in the destination, not like me. And so you start driving out. Half an hour into it, you're wondering, hmm, I don't reach it. 45 minutes into it, hmm, I don't reach it. An hour into it, I'm getting impatient. Because it's all about the destination for me. And everything in between is inconsequential. If I have to stop for something, then I'm going to become frustrated. If somebody asks for a lift, 
a lift that requires me to pull off to a different destination first before heading on to my final destination, I'm going to be upset. Anything that delays me getting there, I'm going to be upset. Anything that requires work, I'm going to be upset because wellness in my mind or the destination in my mind is the only goal. Whereas if your goal is the journey, you know, some families do this. They say, you know what? We're going to go on an excursion all week. We're going to just drive around the island. When it gets dark, we're going to stop somewhere and we're going to, you know, pull over, find lodging for the night, head out early the next, the next morning and continue with our journey to go around the island. For those people, the journey is the goal. And so if somebody asks for a ride and they have to go to a new location, then they're all too happy to do it because it means going somewhere that probably wasn't on their schedule that may actually take them somewhere that they are excited about seeing. So the journey becomes the goal. It's the same when it comes to health. Wellness versus illness. Illness is just wanting to get feel better. You want to just get to the end point. You don't want to work to get there. Whereas wellness is about the journey. It's about the living the wellness lifestyle, eating a particular way. Since November, I've gone fully vegan. Um, in July of 2013, I changed over to pescatarian, which is eating fish only. And I did that from July until November. And I decided to change fully over to, to vegan um, in November of last year. And I, I, I have to tell you, it is not a challenge. It's not, it's not difficult. It's not like it's not difficult to find food because it's more difficult to find food, especially if you're going out somewhere. Um, if you have to dine out, it's harder to find vegan stuff to eat. But if you are at home preparing your meals, it's not so much of a big deal because you just go to the supermarket, pick up what you need. But persons who have to exercise, persons who have to eat a particular way, if you are on the wellness path, those things are not a challenge for you. If you find that these things are a challenge for you, then ask yourself the question, am I thinking like a, an illness care person or am I thinking like a wellness care person? Because if you are, you have to first change the way you think before you can successfully navigate a wellness journey. You can't say you want to change your diet and just jump on a new diet. Oh, it's New Year's resolution. I'm going to eat differently and just eat differently and expect to maintain that. It's not easy to do it that way. It's far easier to change the way you think about your health. Understanding that wellness is a journey. It's a process that requires consistent work to get there. So when we say getting well is not a destination, the goal is to stay well, which means it's an ongoing process that you do over and over again consistently without failing so as to achieve that um, way of living, not that destination because it's a way of living. Because once you've gotten to a wellness state, you don't then say, let me go back to eating all this animal flesh and so on just so that, you know, I've already gotten there so now I can go back to, no. You do what is necessary to be healthy. You do what is necessary. Um, I don't know if you're not able to. Is there anyone that is not able to hear me? I see that Auntie Rowena is not. I see that I can see you, but. I hear you. What are you saying? That you cannot see me, but you can hear me? Or that you cannot see me, but you... Or you say that you can see me, but you cannot hear me. Which is it? Can you hear me or can you see me? Please, Auntie Rowena, or anyone else, chime in so I can know. We don't want anyone to be missing out on this information because it's going to get very heavy here in a minute. Now, the third way that we think is according to how long we live, staying alive, as if the length of life is the gold standard for how healthy somebody is. 
there are many people who are unhealthy but they live long. And there are many people who are healthy but they die early. I know many sick people. They are on 10 different medications. They are on 10 different medications. They are sick. They have diabetes. They have hypertension and so on. But they may live to 85 years old. And then there are some people who have never been a been sick in a day in their life been, been sick a day in their lives and they may die at 80. You see, life and death is not up to us. And so when persons say they want to live a wellness lifestyle, it's living a wellness lifestyle. In other words, as long as you're living, you want to be well. That's that's all wellness is about. It's not how long you live, it's the quality of that life. It is being well as long as you live. Not living as long as you can because you're well. It is living well for as long as you live. That's what wellness is. And so, if I am free of all diseases, but I die at 80, meaning that I am able to walk around the day before, um, maybe I can do farming or whatever the day before and then the next day I, I just go to sleep and forget to wake up. If that's what happens to me, I will not be sad. I'll be very happy and I will feel very accomplished because I want to live a wellness lifestyle. I want to be healthy for the rest of my life. I don't want to be battling some disease and I can't stop death. Death will come. But how does it come? I don't want to be walking and I have a heart attack and drop down in the middle of the street somewhere with my face in the dirt. No. I want to not feel well and go to my bed and sleep and say, boy, you know what? My family are going to go lie down. I'm not feeling so good. Or I said to my family, you know, I feel like this is the end and I'm going to lie down and then boom, they'll wake up. In my own bed. Now, this is what I'm praying for. But there's no guarantee that it will happen this way. But the, well, the healthier you are is the more likely you're going to die in your bed. After a very short period of illness, if you're ill at all. And then you just wake up on the other side of paradise. It is when you're unhealthy, when you're unwell, is when you tend to die. And many persons who are unwell, or very few people who are unwell, will die in their beds. Unless, of course, they have been confined to their beds because of prolonged illness. You know, wherever the stroke happens, wherever the heart attack happens, wherever the... You know, you understand. So let's move forward because we don't want to just stay alive. We want to feel alive. I want to have the full experience of life for as long as I live. You know, if I ever have grandkids, I want to be able to play with them, you know, lift them up, enjoy them. You know, great grandkids, whatever it is that I have. I want to be able to enjoy their, their, their presence until it's time for me to go home. I don't want to forget who they are. I don't want to forget their birthdays. I don't want to forget, you know, anyone. I want to remember my people. So that's why it's important. So here's the deal. If you look at the chart right here, you will see a very subtle change. And that's what it takes, you know, people. The change to move from a wellness lifestyle to an, an illness lifestyle to a wellness lifestyle is a subtle shift in your thinking. Instead of feel, get, stay, you switch it around a little bit to get, stay, feel. Feel better, get well, stay alive becomes get better, stay well, and feel alive. That is the key. That my dear friends, is the key. So let's move forward because people need to understand what pain is. You know, is pain a good thing or a bad thing? There are many people who would argue one or the other, right? Some people will say it's both. Because yes, there are good things about pain and there are bad things about pain. But what I think the bad thing is about pain is not what most people would think the bad thing about pain is. Most people would say the bad thing about pain is that it hurts. But I, I would suggest to you that that is actually the good thing about pain is that it hurts. Because pain is an alert mechanism. It's a, 
it's an alert to let us know that something has changed in our system that needs our attention. And so if it doesn't hurt, we won't go exploring. We will keep ignoring it. And so the pain of pain is what causes us to investigate what's going on because the pain robs us of living. And so it forces us to investigate what's going on, which is what is needed in that regard. But the bad thing about pain is that pain doesn't always warn us. There are many conditions that people have, but they have no pain, so they don't experience the, the, um, the warning. And so they end up going down a path of um, decline. Sometimes a very significant path of decline before they even recognize that something is off to do something about it. So that's why pain cannot be trusted is because it doesn't always tell you when something is wrong. So just because you feel good doesn't mean you have good health. Feeling good is not equivalent to good health. Good health means you're having healthy function. Your body is working properly. If you want to make sure that your body is working properly, you can do two things. One is you can do lab tests to see if something has gone wrong and then try to do a targeted approach to try to address the thing that has gone wrong. Or you can simply do everything in your power to eat as healthy as possible, to think as um, happily as possible, and to interact with persons on a very pleasant plane to ensure that our quality of life is at the best possible to lower the likelihood of having a disease. You see, the happiest people get sick the fewest. The sickest people are usually the saddest people, but the saddest people are usually the sickest people. And so, the Bible even tells us that a joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones and so we understand that what happens in terms of our mindset in terms of our, our our predisposition impacts our quality of life and our health i know people who come to me i can almost tell the people who have the best chance of getting better they have the strongest faith and they have the best outlooks i've seldom ever seen somebody that has that comes to me at the beginning and they say, you know what, Doc? I believe I'm going to get well. I just know I'm going to get better. And they are positive about it and then they don't get better. Whereas on the other side is, I don't think this is going to help me. I think this is a waste of my time. But I'm going to try it anyway. The person who comes like that, sometimes I won't accept their case because I know that just that mindset is going to be enough poison in their system to prevent them from healing. If you want to heal, you have to adjust the way you think. Positive thinking, not in a sense that positive thinking opens doors to all things, opens the universe and all of these things, these new age um, things that are excluding God from the process because I'm a firm believer that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And that's how you get what you want to get. You don't have positive thinking. You ask God. The Bible says that we have not because we ask not. And so we want to ask and ask God for what we need. So if you want to be healthy, the true physician of all things pertaining to health, the true physician is not found in a vaccine. There are people who are putting their hope in a vaccine. The true physician is God. Put your trust in God. Put your hope in God. I know there are persons who think that it's, it is, um, it's just wisdom to cover your basis, again, basis, I guess. So not only are you going to put your trust in God, but you're going to also put your trust in the vaccine. And so you, you marry the two somehow. They don't have to be exclusionary. But... Putting your trust in God doesn't mean that you have to follow the wisdom of man. In fact, the wisdom of man is, is, according to the Bible, folly to God. And what's folly to God is wisdom to man. I mean, 
What's weakness to God is strength to man. What strength to man is weakness to God. The way we perceive God, God is bigger than that. And so that's my pitch for God for, to, uh, for this part of tonight. I, I can't promise that I won't say anything else about it. But, you know, I live my life centered on God and try my best to live in a way that honors him in gratitude for what he has done for me. Not in fear of hell. I don't fear hell. I've, al I've already been liberated from hell. So why would I fear something I've already been liberated from? I live my life because of gratitude for the liberation that I've had in Christ Jesus. So that's that for me, right? So we have to trust the way our bodies work, not the way we feel. So when we look at the systems of the body, there are many systems of the body. The immune system, digestive system, cardiovascular, integumentary system is your skin and coverings, your respiratory system, endocrine system for your hormones, your reproductive system, your excretory system, your musculoskeletal system, and your nervous system. These are the different systems of the body. And if we eat a wide variety of foods, in particular, plant-based foods, herbs, spices, um, fruits, we will have the best chance of being healthy in all areas, in all areas of life. And so all of these systems will have a better chance. You know, when you look at what the, the scientists are saying is the cause of heart disease, um, high cholesterol is what they will oftentimes blame for, high, for heart disease. What causes high cholesterol? Um, primarily an animal-based diet. diet. Animal-based diet is what leads to heart disease. It's what leads to most of the issues that we have. Even cancers. And if we live our lives in such a way to avoid those things, then we are increasing the likelihood of being healthy in all dimensions. And that is the key. So let's move on. Because I want you to understand something here as well. So when we look at the body, I want to show you something here. When you look at the at the organ system of the body, you will see that every single organ of the body, every organ of the body is connected by nerves. Nerves connect every organ. You see these yellow things and these blue things? These are the nerves. And if you look carefully, what you will see is that all the nerves of our bodies or all the organs of our bodies have a nerve supply. Not just do they have a nerve supply, but if you look carefully, you will see that you have a yellow and a blue nerve that goes to every organ. If you look carefully, you'll see every organ has a yellow and a blue nerve that goes to it. Can you see that? This is the grand organization of the body, so I want you to understand here what I'm showing you, right? Every nerve has a blue and a yellow nerve. Every organ has a blue and yellow nerve that goes to it. So what's the purpose of the blue and yellow nerves? The yellow nerves that come from the spine are part of the what we call the sympathetic system. And the blue ones are what we call the parasympathetic system. The sympathetic system, which is our fight or flight system, is the one that gets activated when we are under stress. So those are the yellow ones here. So what does the yellow one do to the heart? It speeds up the heart. What does the yellow one do to the lungs? It speeds up the lungs and makes the breathing deeper and faster. 
What do the yellow ones do to the digestive system, the stomach, the liver, the pancreas, the kidneys, the um, large intestines? The yellow ones act as a slowing down um, signal for those systems. So in other words, it will speed up the heart when you're stressed, but at the same time when you're stressed, your digestive system shuts down. And then the blue ones will do the exact opposite to that organ. The blue one will slow down the heart, slow down the lung, and speed up the digestion. The blue one becomes active when we are relaxed. And that's why when you're eating your dinner, you should not be stressed because it shuts off your digestive system and you should be relaxed. And so when you listen to live music, it relaxes you. That's why the best restaurants, the most expensive restaurants, will often have live music. That's why the lighting is softer. That's why when you go into the best restaurants, the, the lighting is more natural light. Instead of fluorescent lighting, they usually have a softer um, incandescent light or fireplace light. Because these natural lights, the lights that are more natural, tend to be more relaxing. That's why you have a glass of wine, because wine relaxes you with your meal. And so this is how the body works. That's why I tell people, never eat on your way to work. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you will see me here. As I say this, never eat on your way to work. Because when you're on your way to work in traffic, you're in a stressful environment. Cars coming at you from all over, and then you are trying to eat and digest your food. It will not work. It will not work. And here's another thing. If you are stressing out your wife, and I'm talking to the men, if you are stressing out your wife, your poor wife is stressed because of you. It's going to shut down her sexual interest. Sex also shuts down your sexual interest. But I'm, I'm going to have to say, <coughs> say something here. Here. <coughs> Excuse me. Say something here for that. But if you, if you stress your wife out, don't expect that when you go home, you're going to be able to be romantic with her. <coughs> you have to do what is required to get her relaxed. That's why a massage is good. That's why speaking softly and kindly and lovingly is good. That's why a tender touch is good. That's why soft music is good. That's why mood lighting is good. That's why when she asks you to do something, you do it. It's good because these things relax her. It lets her know that she is not in it by herself. She has a vested partner that's in it for her. So if you do these things, gentlemen, this is my counseling session for tonight. If you do these things, gentlemen, your wife will be receptive to you in all areas. And if she is not receptive to you, please don't blame her. Blame yourself. Because there is something that you're doing or you're failing to do that you need to do that's causing it. So figure it out and fix it. Don't blame the messenger. Don't blame the messenger. Just say thank you and move on. All right. Now, I went through all of that because what we know is that the nervous system is the mass control system of the body. And that nervous system is governed by, or it governs all our nerves, all our function, all our organ systems are controlled by the nerves. That's why we call it the mass control system. But some of these nerves travel through the spine. And as they travel through the spine, what you see happening is these different areas of the spine. If there's a problem in the spine, it can affect some nerves. Some people have car accidents, and because of the car accident, they end up with an issue in their necks. And so because of the issue in their neck, they may have rapid heartbeats. Or they may have um, vision problems or dizziness, or they may have um, difficulty producing enough saliva. 
or tears, the eyes start to water. There are many different things that can happen as a result of an injury to an area that controls the passage of a nerve. And so that is important for us to recognize because if we don't see the nerves that are most likely going to be affected by trauma, like a car accident, are these yellow ones because these yellow ones are the ones that come from the spine. The blue ones come from the brain stem. So if you notice, the blue ones come from the brain stem or the tailbone. See? They come from the brain stem or the tailbone. And so if there's a problem in those areas, you can have the parasympathetic effect um, dominating. But if it happens in the yellow ones, which is what is the most common one, it will affect the yellow ones. And the yellow ones, what do the yellow ones do? Remember, the yellow ones will cause a rapidity of the heartbeat or increased breathing, which is what we see happening. People with, 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 with um, hearts, their heart palpitating or heart racing. Or they can't digest their foods properly. People start having acid reflux and different things as a result because of the poor digestion. I'm not going to go through the whole talk tonight. I'm going to just go through um, just some of it because really I don't want to spend the whole night discussing these things. I just want to give you enough of a taste so that you understand the value of a wellness lifestyle. Right? And the good news is, and as Derry Berry is saying, um, that the neck and the rapid heartbeat sounds like her. Assuming it's a her. Um, which they go together, and oftentimes, if we can fix the heart, the, 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 the neck issue, the rapid heartbeat goes back to normal. We see it all the time. Look. If I look at a color, or if I look in a, in a box and I see that there's a ball in the box, I don't need anybody to tell me if there is a study that was conducted to prove that there's a ball in the box. I've seen it. It is called first hand testimony or an eyewitness testimony. So I'm going to give you eyewitness testimony, which is the highest form of evidence. You see, clinical research or clinical trials have their value. But if clinical research tells me that taking a blue pill will make my life better, and I take this blue pill and my life isn't better, which do you think is more critical? What you observe. So I can tell you something that I've observed personally with my patients. I've seen many people with rapid heartbeats following car accidents. And when we realign the issues happening with their necks or correct the issues in their spine, their heartbeat goes back to normal. I've had people with heartbeats over 100 beats per minute, 120 beats per minute, 110 beats per minute. Without medication, go back to 60, 70 beats per minute with just the treatments. Not that the treatment is for heartbeats or for your rapid heartbeat. The treatment is not for that. Chiropractic care is not for any symptom. Chiropractic care is for the underlying spinal issues. If you can correct the spinal issues and whatever the spine will control, whatever the nerves will control from that area, if it is caused by it, will improve. So, you know, you can take that, you know, as you will. I know people who say there's no proof that chiropractic works. There's no evidence that chiropractic works. I'll give you evidence that chiropractic works. I have seen it work. It works in my office. Chiropractic works. Now, you can probably convince somebody who doesn't have that eyewitness testimony or that eyewitness experience that it doesn't work. And they might believe you. But once they have experienced it themselves, you can't convince them otherwise. And this is what more and more of our patients are finding out as time is going on which is kind of exciting to see.
A misalignment in the spine is called a vertebral subluxation. That's what we call a misalignment in the spine. Um, vertebral meaning the spine. Subluxation is less than a dislocation. So it's when a bone has shifted a little out of place. That's what a subluxation is. You shift a bone out of place and it irritates a nerve. Then you may end up with the consequences of the nerve being irritated. And so if you notice in this diagram, the third bone in is pushed out of alignment with the others. <clears throat> This opening that's in the back here is the opening that allows the nerves to go through. If you push a bone out of place, it's not only going to be out of alignment, it's going to close off the opening where the nerve comes through, which may irritate the nerve that exits there. And if this nerve controls your heart rate, then you will find that your heart rate is impacted. And remember, we said that the nerves that come from the spine that goes to the heart, those are part of your sympathetic system. So they will cause a rapid heartbeat if you irritate that nerve. Eventually, the nerve will stop firing and then the heart rate will slow down to below normal. So it's a very serious thing, right? If we can open up at this space, taking the irritation away from the nerve, then we can have restoration of function. Next, we also have the things that will cause these subluxations to occur or issues to occur in the body. And it is stress, and stress happens in three dimensions. The physical, like a fall, car accident, trauma, somebody was in a fight, somebody was in a traumatic relationship, abuse. Um, the physical, right? Biochemical, uh, things that you ingest, like the food you eat, things that you breathe in, things that you put on your skin. These are the biochemical stressors. And then you have psychological stressors, um, our mindset, our way of thinking, our attitudes, or how we feel in our relationships. Are we feeling fulfilled? Are we feeling loved? Are we in a job that is stressing us out? So these are important. Yes? And if they are happening they can destroy your humanity so we do not want to live in a constant state of stress but at the same time some amount of stress is good for a time but if we are stressed for too long it leads to a problem that sometimes can be irreversible so understand what we're saying right i'm going to skip that fifth key as important as it is right and I'll say this, that how does chiropractic work? That chiropractic improves our ability to adapt to our stresses because chiropractic improves our nervous system function. And our nerves is what allow us to respond to what we experience in life, our stresses. And so we can say that chiropractic widens our gap of um, our potential for, for adapting to our stress. Chiropractic improves our ability, but it's not the only thing. Because if you do chiropractic care, but you do not live in a way that's conducive to good health, you will not be healthy. Because no one thing is going to fix everything. The thing about health is that it's not a magic bullet. There is no food. I mean, there is no accident in, in this. There is no food that has every nutrient in it that the body needs. No one plant source. That has every single nutrient in it that the body needs. None that I'm aware of. They will, some will have a majority. In fact, uh, Moringa has a large percentage of the essential things that we will need, including essential amino acids to build our bodies, to build protein in our bodies. Moringa has that. But Moringa doesn't have every single thing that we need. Um, there is no plant source of vitamin B12. So that is also something. But there are, there are other ways of getting B12 in your system without having to go to an animal source. All right. So um, I remember somebody was sharing with me, and I don't remember if I did the research or not. I don't think I've done the research. I would have remembered. But I was told that as you sleep, the bacteria in your mouth as it digests the different 
particles in your mouth from the day before, it will make B12 in your saliva that upon waking, you should not brush your teeth or rinse out your mouth first. You should drink a glass of water and especially room temperature water, swish out your mouth and swallow it because you can get B12 that way. All right, so that's something. In fact, um, most persons will tell you the best practice is upon waking first thing in the morning is to drink two tall glasses of room temperature water. Very important. Very important. How do we identify these things in people? Uh, we have technology that we have employed here at the office to help us to identify whether there's a subluxation in somebody's spine because subluxations, misalignments, have consequences. They may affect the muscles around the spine or it may affect the temperature of the skin, which we can measure. It doesn't always, but they can, and it gives us some insight. So these are two pieces of technology, our rolling thermal scanner and our surface EMG scanner, surface electromyography, that we use to measure the functions of the spine to make sure everything is working well. So there's a question that people often ask, and that is, is there any evidence that chiropractic actually works? From a study standpoint, right? Have there been any studies? There are many studies, by the way, um, that demonstrate that chiropractic can impact a person's functions. And depends on what the question is you're trying to answer, will determine what the outcome is. But the mistake that most studies make, and I, I think it might be deliberate, is this, that chiropractic doesn't treat a condition. Because chiropractic doesn't treat symptoms. Chiropractic realigns the spine. If the spine is having a dysfunction and you can correct the spinal dysfunction, then whatever the consequence to that dysfunction is will improve. That's how chiropractic works. You can't simply ask the question, is chiropractic good for headaches? Or is chiropractic good for backaches? Because it's not a one-to-one -one relationship between the two. Yes, if somebody has back pain and they go to a chiropractor, the majority of them may experience relief. But that's not because chiropractic is good for back pain. Chiropractic is good to improve the function of the spine. What is causing the back pain? If the back pain is being caused by a tumor in your spine, it will not improve that situation at all. In fact, it might make it worse. If your back pain is caused by an infection in your spine, it may make it worse. If the back pain is caused by a misalignment in your spine, then chiropractic definitely can help. The interesting thing and the important thing to take home is this. Of those three conditions or of those three class, class, classes or conditions of, uh, that I've described to you, which do you think is the most common to happen? A tumor in the spine, an infection in the spine, or misalignment of the spine? A misalignment in the spine. And because a misalignment is so common, you find that the vast majority of people with a back issue, it's actually caused by a misalignment. And so if your back issue is caused by a misalignment, then the chiropractic care will help. Makes sense. What about headaches? If your headache is caused by a misalignment in your spine, chiropractic care will help. What about high blood pressure? If it's caused by a misalignment in your spine, chiropractic can help. What about asthma? What about sinusitis? What about vertigo? What about constipation? What about diarrhea? All of these things, the answer is the same. Chiropractic doesn't treat a condition. Chiropractic corrects a spinal issue. So if these things are caused by a spinal issue and you can correct the spine, they will go away. Because the body doesn't negotiate with you whether it wants to be healthy. If you irritate or you um, block the body's ability to be well, it will not express health. If you remove the impediment to health, then the body will experience health. So it's like gravity. Because if I have this pouch right here, this pouch in my hand, 
if I have this pouch and I'm holding it, gravity wants to pull it down to the table. But because my hand is here, it's preventing it from happening. If I were to remove my hand from holding this thing up, and nothing else is holding it up, if I remove my hand, what will happen? Will it hover there? Or will it follow the law of gravity and go down? It will follow the law of gravity and go down. And that's how this works. That's how the body works, you know. That's how the body works. It will follow the laws of gravity and go down. And the law of healing is exactly the same way. If you remove the impediment to good health, healing will occur naturally. But there's not that's not the only way that care packet works because it doesn't rely on you having to have a problem first before you can um, experience the benefits of chiropractic because what you find is if the body is trying to deal with 10 problems and the spine has a problem as, as well and that's one of the problems and when you correct the spinal problems it fixes three or four other problems then the body is now dealing with six problems instead of ten problems and if it is now dealing with only six problems and you can and nothing else changes, then the body has a better chance of healing those other six things than it did when you were trying to heal 10 different things. And so by realigning your spine, you may improve the or reduce the strain on the body so that healing can now occur at a better pace. And so sometimes people might have a problem that's not even related to chiropractic. But having gotten chiropractic care, the problem starts to get better. Not because the problem was a chiropractic problem, but because chiropractic improved the healing capacity of the person. And so they started to heal. I hope all of this is making sense to you. So a lady was asked to wiggle her left ankle, and they took a picture of her brain. And when they took this picture of her brain, And I'm going to try to show you here. When they asked to take a picture of her brain, on the left hand side was before the adjustment, and on the right hand side was after the adjustment. So before the adjustment, you could see. This is what the brain looks like. And all these colors that you see are areas of lights. The lighted areas, according to this test, which is called a functional MRI, are areas of increased brain activity. So in other words, she was asked to wiggle her left ankle, and all over her brain there was activity to do that task. That's not very efficient, because too many areas of the brain are involved in that simple task. It should not even be the case. She received the chiropractic adjustment and the test repeated, and this is what they identified, that there was a smaller area of brain activation in order to complete the task, which means that the brain became more efficient. And we understand why, because there, and there are numerous studies that show the, the impact of the adjustment, the adjustment of the spine on the brain, not just in humans, but also in rodents. They've done many different studies in rats to demonstrate this effect. And so what we find is the brain can see the body better, and so it improves the communication ability between the brain and the body by simply getting a chiropractic adjustment. And that is important to see. That's an important point. So... Persons ask the question. Persons ask the question, is chiropractic good for bones? And the answer is no. Chiropractic is not something that's good for bones. It's not bad for the bones, 
but it's nothing to do with the bones except that we move the bones to, to stimulate the nerves. And so people think that chiropractors are bone doctors and the reality is that chiropractors are not bone doctors. They are nervous system doctors. Chiropractors are not bone doctors. They are nervous system doctors. And that is important to recognize. Very important to recognize. I hope I'm making sense. We're about to close off now as we finish up. I'm a chiropractic neurologist, which means that I'm especially, um, I have special training, didn't want to use the word training, to retrain the brain with exercises and therapies and so on, specific to the brain. All chiropractors are trained to realign the spine, which is to um, correct these spinal misalignments. So you, you, if you're having a spinal misalignment, any chiropractor should be able to do the job to help you. Sometimes it's a matter of personality, if you prefer one personality over another, but really, chiropractic works. The question is, does the chiropractor do what he's supposed to or she's supposed to do? Um, and that's the only question you really have to ask, because chiropractic works. It's not about the practitioner, per se, except that they are practicing chiropractic. Now... There are different conditions that, as a chiropractic neurologist, I've worked with. These conditions include developmental delays, learning challenges, neurodevelopmental disorders or neuro neurobehavioral disorders like ADHD, OCD, ODD, Tourette syndrome, neurodeficits like autism, cerebral palsy, um, balance and movement disorders, and brain injuries. So these are some common things that we see in the office and we try to address. So, our vision is threefold in our office, is to identify subluxations wherever they happen, provide a program of care, and educate our community. And this class is one way that we choose to educate our community. I hope you take it seriously because I take it seriously. So the key to success, we talked about there are seven keys, we, we skipped over the fifth key, but there are seven keys and the key to success in getting and staying well, the punchline of it all is this. We have to take responsibility for our health and well-being. The key to success in getting and staying well is to take responsibility for our health and well-being. So we have to make wise choices, right? Our children's health is our responsibility too, so we have to make wise choices there as well. I have a video testimonial on my on the um, YouTube channel. So if you are here, that means you have um you can just once a video is finished you can go look for our other videos on this same channel and you should be able to see some of these testimonials this is one of my favorite ones with joy we have a special offer for those and this is the last thing we're gonna do we have a special offer for those who are here tonight um if you are not currently a patient of ours that's if you are not currently a patient we offer a 40% discount off your new patient examination and your new neurospinal exam fees. In order to benefit from that, um, there's something that you're going to have to do. In order to benefit, you have to send an email to appointments at gcnjamaica.com. That's appointments at gcnjamaica.com. And let them know that you participated in this class. They will check the recording and verify that your name is listed in the chat. So if you've not yet indicated in the chat that you participated or that you listened in, please make sure that you do so now. Next is... Um, for those persons who are already patients of ours, if you're already a patient of ours, then we will give you, you already qualify for it just by being here. So just make sure you don't really have to do anything else. Just make sure that your, your name is listed in this chat, having commented or, or, or something. Um, you will get a 40% off your new patient, sorry, a 20% off the update examination. 
that's 20% off and the update exam is almost the cost of the normal the new patient exam so you're getting half that discount plus for every person that you refer you get a 20% discount per person per treatment so if you refer one person you get 20% off one treatment <laughs> Finally, Darian has, has come clean. And if you are an existing patient, you will also get a 10% discount off your next phase of care. If you've already attended the patient health workshop, then you don't get these discounts multiple times. You'll, you'll get it once. But we welcome you participating as many times as possible, right? Now, just really quickly, we are on social media. On YouTube, we are at Gardner Chiropractic, so make sure that you indicate such. If you want to find our channel on YouTube, just go to Gardner Chiropractic. Make sure you subscribe to our channel, because I know not everyone has already subscribed. So please make sure that you're subscribing to our channel. Very good. Um, you can go to our website, which is gcnjamaica.com, and you can see different information about us either on our website or on our Facebook page. Um, our Facebook page for the office is GCN Jamaica. But on a Tuesday night, we have a radio program at seven o'clock every. Uh, sorry, at eight o'clock every Tuesday night on RGR 94FM that we live stream on Facebook at Back to Health Talk Show. So if you have been aware of our show on the radio, just know that you can also watch us on YouTube, on Facebook Live, in studio. Um, so you're welcome to do that. If you didn't know, then now you know. That's Tuesday nights at, at 8 p.m. for one hour. 8 to 9 every Tuesday night. So... It was indeed my pleasure getting to um, spend time with you all here. And I hope that you learned something. I hope that it was beneficial. If you have any questions, I'll try to stay on for about two to five minutes to answer those questions. But if I don't see any questions coming in, I'm just going to log off. But I had a wonderful time with you all tonight. I hope you enjoyed yourselves as well. I enjoyed having you. Thank you very much, Darian. Thank you very much, Charmaine. Thank you, Daniel um, Sicard, for your comments. I appreciate your tuning in as well. And we look forward to having this. Our next show is on February 4th. Our next show is on February 4th. So be sure to tune in on February 4th at 6 p.m. For our next patient health, patient health workshop right here on YouTube at Gardner Chiropractic. So thank you very much everyone for participating. You have a wonderful night and as I promised I'll stay on for a couple minutes to answer any questions if you have any. So good night and God bless.